Hello, everyone, and welcome. Before we get started with this, the latest Open Chain community call, and the first in our series of a new monthly community schedule, I'm going to share our antitrust policy notice. So this is something we show at the beginning of every meeting, and it ensures that we all know the rules under which we interact and collaborate around the Open Chain project. Today's call has a relatively full agenda. Uh, we're going to go through things at the pace necessary to get them done. We have up to one hour uh, in our schedule, but of course, if we get things done more quickly, that's just fine. The format is going to be as follows, and here I'm going to share um, the email I sent out to everyone about this event. So we have our introductions. We have some information about our specification or process standards news, some SBOM news, some OSPO news, automation news, and then we're gonna go on to the community feedback uh, and how we basically do more things together. Now, when it comes to the community feedback and so on, uh, that's gonna be relatively fluid. There's, I think, two main things we're going to do today. The first one will be to look at how we did some stuff around our newest and most important specification work, a brand new security assurance specification that has been released in September. Um, and also to look at some of our reference or educational material, which needs a bit of a refresh. In particular, we're going to take a look at the path to conformance and the FAQ. But before we do that, let's do a quick round of introductions. Switching on my own video, I'm Shane Coughlin, the general manager of the Open Chain Project. Um, it's my job to facilitate calls like this and to bring our community together. I'm going to call out people on the line, and if you could just very briefly say hi, that would be great. First person is Anna, who is sneaking in here from To Do Group. Hi, hi everyone. Um, Anna Jimenez, program manager at To Do Group, and happy to be here and learn something, uh, some more things about Open Chain, and also share my insights on Osbos. And. Of course, Anna is going to be taking over and doing the OSPO news for us, what with it being uh, not only something she does, but she's at the center of the global activity around this. Thank you, Anna. Next up, Andrew Katz. Andrew is desperately hunting for the mute button. <laughs> it's a wild guess. Uh, because Andrew is not unmuted, lad, I'm going to move on to the next person. We have Dave Moore on the line. Dave, can you briefly say hello and introduce yourself? Hello, uh, Dave Moore here from Qualcomm, and I'm uh, uh, highly involved from the Open Chain project from the beginning. Thanks. Dave has typically understated his role. He's uh, the key founder of the project and the chairperson. <laughs> Um, Giovanna, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you uh, for uh, the introduction, Shane. Um, it's good to see a, a lot of familiar names and faces. Um, my name is Giovanna Fessenden. I'm a, a patent attorney and IP attorney. I, I do a lot of work in open source and my background's in computer science. And I'm also a, a blockchain uh, technology specialist. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Good to have you here. Yari, over to you. Hold on, like why my video is not showing? Oh, hold on, let me just pick up the other camera. That's why. There I am. So yeah. Hi all, Yari, I see also many familiar names and faces here. And uh, yeah, I've been contributing to uh, Open Chain and also to To Do Group a little bit. And uh, currently I work as, a, I, I think the title is called OSPO lead at the KPMG International. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much, Yari. And for those who don't know, Yari has been deeply involved in contributing to open chain material uh, throughout the last few years and especially has been critical in our educational uh, work recently. Jeff, over to you. Well, thanks, Shane. I uh, appreciate it. I uh, always love uh, joining the open, open chain group here. My name is Jeff Flush. I'm the director of open source at Peak6, which is a fintech company. Uh, previously, I founded Palomita, which is one of the first SEA companies way back when, uh, before we had SBOMs and SCA. Um, and I love talking about OSPOs and SBOMs and scanning, and I'm here to learn from everybody on this call. So I really appreciate uh, uh, the time today. Thank you, Jeff. And we have Lufuno on the line, our first partner in South Africa. Hey, Lufuno, how are you doing today? I don't know if you can see me. It seems I'm in the dark. Sorry, I forgot to switch off the lights, to switch on, so I'll just <laughs> take off my video. Yeah, I'll show my face after my introduction. Um, my name is Lupuna Chikarangi Korumbi. I'm a South African in South Africa. Um, kind of new in open chain project and I am running a cyber law consultancy. Uh, our area of specialization is cyber security and um, I'm an open source advocate. So that's the reason why I joined open chain. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lufuno. And over to you, Lucas. If Lucas is having some trouble unmuting, I'm going to cycle back to Andrew Katz, who had some trouble earlier, but I think it might have cleared up. Excellent, thanks, Shane. Um, many apologies. I don't know if you can see me or not, but hopefully you can you can hear me. Um, so, hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Katz. Um, I'm a lawyer who's been specialising in open source for well over twenty years. And uh, I also uh, run a company called Orcro. So my law firm, Orcrofts, and uh, my compliance company, Orcro, are both open chain partner companies. And um, we are um, spend most of our time advising people on um, free and open source compliance issues. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, just like Dave, Andrew's understating some of his contributions. For example, he's the key driver behind stuff like our open source policy template, which has gone very far into the industry, just like our training slides, far beyond our spec and our community, which is wonderful and on target for the type of impact we want. Uh, Mary, over to you. If Mary's having trouble unmuting right now, I'm gonna jump ahead to Nathan. We can swing back to you, Mary, if you're ready to talk uh, in a little while. I'm ready. Oh, okay, off you go. I hit the wrong unmute button. Um, I'm, my name is Mary Matron. I work for Continental Automotive. I'm part of the open source compliance team, mostly working on things like um, uh, performance of the team in general, process, uh, and open chain specifically open chain getting our uh, first self certification this year we hope excellent well that's the yep. type of news we want to hear thank you mary mm -hmm. nathan over to you uh, hey everyone nice to see you all I'm nathan kuma guy uh, i work with dave mar at qualcomm on the open source team and i've helped with the uh, onboarding team at the open chain Nathan uh, has also taken the modest route here. He's been part of the project for so many years. Uh, so also in place almost since before we were a thing. And uh, he's currently about to do some of the heavy lifting as we rejig our onboarding and educational material. Now we're moving on to Seth. And as a spoiler, Seth is critical to our standardization efforts. Seth, over to you. Uh, hi, I'm not sure if you can see me, um, but anyway, I'm Seth Newberry. I'm the general manager of the Joint Development Foundation, which is the um, 
entity at Linux Foundation that that helps uh, um, run standards. And at the same time, we are also a pass submitter, which is a kind of a technical term within. Uh, we, we have applied to become a, a, we are certified as a pass submitter, and therefore we can bring specifications from our organizations into the ISO community um, to have them recognized as ISO standards. So uh, we, we our very first pass project was the open chain specification, and our now third pass project is going to be the uh, security standard that you were uh, putting together. Um, our colleague Rex uh, Jasky seems to have already finished the first draft of the spec, uh, putting it into the very specialized ISO format. Uh, so really, we're on a very fast track to get this into ISO. And uh, Shane and I merely need to do a, what they call a, a sort of a, it's, it's preface material. It's, a, it's kind of a, a summary of what we're trying to do. Um, uh, as part of the process. And uh, so we could easily be into pass uh, 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 balloting in the next week or so. Um, the pass process is lengthy. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, our, our normal sort of front to back is probably about 26 weeks, um, simply because most of that time is balloting and transcribing and all sorts of other things. Um, but nevertheless, being quickly into it is great. Uh, Shane did a great job in introducing this. There's sort of a new process within the past process where you have to talk to the uh, uh, um, uh, technical committee at, at um, JTC1 to kind of make sure that we're that what we're trying to do doesn't interfere with their work. So we've talked to FC27. Uh, I think that was successful. Uh, they wanted some things that they're not going to get. Uh, and you've been through that process with Shane now. And so, um, like I say, I expect a good result and I expect it quickly. Seth, thank you so much. And we are going to be bringing back Seth. He's kindly volunteered to do a heavy level of you know, exploring how this type of standardization works, what JDF is doing, and basically give everyone a deep dive for their reference red education and records. And that'll be happening uh, sometime in the next few weeks, we'll have a special webinar for that, uh, probably towards end of October or early November. But long story all short, I, sorry, all I can ahead. say is be careful what you wish for. <laughs> okay, we'll schedule that as a five hour one then. <laughs> the processes, everyone can get intense, but we're very fortunate to have Seth who has navigated these for years. Next up on the interest, and we have Stephen. Hey, Stephen, over to you. Uh, morning, evening, afternoon, etc. everybody. Um, I am Stephen Kilbay and I'm based in Scotland. I'm the open source program manager for um, analog devices. Uh, I've been lurking on the open chain calls for a couple of years now and slowly starting to actually get involved in some kind of contributions. And I'm um, happy to meet you all again. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Stephen has been a super contributor in, in many areas and especially has helped us get the security uh, spec across the line, which will be our first and main piece of news right after our final intro with SZ. SZ, over to you. It's again late night there. My goodness. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, you're currently at just past midnight in Taipei, I believe, right? Yes, it's midnight. So yeah, I, a little bit of drowsy. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is SZ. <laughs> I have been involved in the open chain community for a while, especially uh, keep promoting the open chain in Taiwan. My background is a uh, software engineer and uh, nowadays, I work for Blue of Veritas as a security, cybersecurity expert. And as a Debian developer, I love contributing the open source in my leisure time. It's my pleasure to meet all of you um, via the uh, Zoom. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you, SZ. And for those of you who are new to our community, SZ uh, was our first board member from Moxa in Taiwan. And of course, he has led Buna Veritas into being our first certifier with the Taipei office offering third, pi, um, third party certification. So our first certifier in Taiwan as well. Alrighty, we're moving on to the news part. So we're gonna do news around spec, SBOM and OSPO and then automation. Uh, let's jump into what would be for our project, the meat of it, some news about the spec. As of a few minutes ago, the Open Chain Security Assurance Specification 1.1 is available. To put this into context, uh, we completed a security assurance reference specification in March of this year. We finished it uh, and published it to prepare it for ISO IEC submission in late September. As part of what Seth mentioned, the consultation process with um, the ISO work group specialized in security, uh, we took some comments in from them. We were looking for editorial comments uh, to allow us to catch any errors in the document as opposed to scope and function comments, which would expand or contract the specification. Uh, and those were pushed to our version two second generation spec discussion, which will start later this month. Anyway, long story short, we've had a license compliance specification in market since 2016. That became an ISO standard in 2020. Now we have a sister security compliance specification in market that is scheduled to become an ISO standard around mid 2023. This means that people will have the same type of easy, clear and effective process inflection points identified for security as they've had for license compliance. The two standards are different, uh, but they are similar. If you adopt one, it's not a huge leap to adopt another. As a family of process standards, they now offer a way for companies which may be used to doing things informally or in an ad hoc manner to actually align with industry best practices. And once people use our lightweight standards in areas like security, they can graduate further on into more complete and complex standards for the nuances of security in their specific domain. The available, availability of the security assurance spec uh, is complete. People can begin adopting it today. And if they adopt the uh, security assurance spec 1.1 from us, they will already be uh, conformant with the ISO standard when it is put in market in mid-2023. We'll have a chance to dig into some of the details around this in a little while, uh, and I will swing back to it uh, a little bit later in our call to show you some of the movie magic behind how this type of spec news works. You will hear a lot more about this in the coming days and months, but we're going to run through some more news items before we get super interactive. I wanted to mention one or two things around the world of S-bombs. Uh, many of you will be familiar with SPDX, which is a sister standard to OpenChain. OpenChain is a very high level standard, uh, and it's focused on license compliance, so we, we identify some process points. Um, SPDX is very much focused on the details and the nuance of Sulfur Bill of Materials. I'm just going to share their website and share a link to it for you. Recently, SPDX released the latest version of their standard, uh, version 2.3. And it may be of interest to you if you're doing software built materials that SPDX 2.3 is focused quite considerably on enhancing the coverage in the security domain. So in the same way that the Open Chain project has released a security assurance specification, the SPDX project has enhanced their software bill of materials to more completely cover the security domain. Interestingly, for those of you based in North America, the primary work around this was not done by North American companies. The primary work around security in SPDX uh, was led by contributors in Europe, which is 
you know, a, a very positive thing, I think, in showing growth of the global community. And it also reflects the fact that in Europe, there's a great deal of effort around cybersecurity as well. So that's positive, and it's good news for those of you looking at um, SPDX adoption as a software bill of materials. Naturally, OpenChain will continue working very closely with SPDX to make sure that if people are using our process standard and they want to get more granular, they can use SPDX easily as a software bill of materials. That said, of course, we're not prescriptive, and people can use any software bill of materials they want. Uh, but our good friends at SPDX are naturally doing a great job. Okay, here I'm going to hand over to Anna for our OSPO news. Anna, what have you got for us? Thank you, Sam. Uh, so let me first share my screen, see if it's possible. Okay, can everyone see my screen? We are loving the plushie, yes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so that that is uh, the it's called Ospo T because it comes from Ospo and Mochi and it's it's a new mascot. Uh, so uh, meet Ospo T, everyone. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight some Ospo updates that have been happening over the past months. Uh, part of that from the Tudor Group, part of that from other open source communities that we are uh, trying to uh, collaborate, such as OpenChain as well. And um, I've also shared these slides with you in case you want to deep dive into the links and resources I share uh, during this presentation. Um, so first thing uh, I, will, I wanted to point out was is that tomorrow we have a uh, to do community call that we call us apology. Those are webinars and uh, tomorrow's session is going to be about uh, metrics and strategy for open source program offices. For that, we are bringing um, community specialists from the chaos community that they are focused on uh, creating metrics and standards for community health and uh, community health metrics. Um, and we are having some OSPO leaders, such as uh, Dan Foster from VMware OSPO, Mike Nolan from uh, Research Institute of Technology OSPO, and uh, people from the OSPO, from the Chaos uh, community and uh, well-known maintainers that we will be uh, answering some questions on uh, how uh, OSPOs can uh, measure the success of the program and, and how these organizations are doing that. And then we will leave some space for discussion so people can ask questions or maybe someone can share uh, different perspectives and different ideas on how they measure their OSPO. Uh, so I think the easiest way to ask, access that is going to the to the group.org slash community. We have a calendar and in there people can import the calendar or if they won't, don't don't want to import it, they can just can go and check and go to the link, and they will be joining this Zoom this uh, the Zoom call. Um, the next new is that this October, I think on starting on October nineteenth and October twentieth, it's a two day uh, event. We're having Spology Live workshop. So what is this? Uh, this is a collaborative effort across different open source communities. Uh, there is OpenChain, there is XPDX, there is OpenSSF, there is Chaos, and there is Studio. And uh, we are organized, uh, this is being organized, the first one uh, by OSPO at Ericsson in Stockholm. So this is an effort that right now we're uh, launching in uh, Europe regions. Uh, to help organizations in Europe to adopt an open source program offices based on the specific region needs. So all these communities uh, will gather together. We will be uh, sharing uh, some community updates and uh, projects and initiatives that are being done on each of these different um, communities. And then we will be the second day we will be gathering into round tables. It will be like more an, as an unconference style where the audience vote for specific topics that they would like to cover. 
And uh, from those roundtable sessions, we can get an output, maybe a new working group in a for a specific uh, community or a new uh, guide or best practices on, on a specific challenges uh, for, for the audience. So uh, that's it. That is going to be in, in Ericsson offices in Stockholm, October 19th to 20th. And here is the link to RSVP in case you're interested. And if you are based in Europe, I mean, if you're not based in Europe, you can, of course, still attending, but maybe that is going to be not easy for you at, right now to try to book uh, flights and so on. But well, who knows? Um, the next new is that uh, during open source summit in Europe, uh, the Tutor Group has been releasing OSPO surveys to measure the status of OSPOs. Uh, and we studied that in, uh, uh, in 2018, as far as I know. Yeah, so this is the fifth edition. Uh, so this is a way to get a pulse of OSPO adoptions worldwide and how is the status of the OSPO evolving and the value of OSPOs evolving. And uh, we just released the, uh, this, this year results. Um, people can go to the uh, blog announcement and uh, download the PDF. And also for those ones that are data scientists and likes to deep dive into the data and find and get all the findings, we also have released the public uh, data in the in one of the to do GitHub repos, so you all the data is available and you can access that as well. Um, next, uh, one of the things we are trying to foster at to do is to build this uh, collaboration with other communities. So part of this uh, cross community collaboration uh, has been uh, this uh, new article we have been uh, doing in collaboration with OpenSSF. Uh, and we have been sharing best practices to help OSPOs to, with open source sustainability and security, like some best practices that open source program offices can take if they are interested to uh, accelerate and uh, be better open source citizens and improve uh, the security of the open source projects they depend on. Um, another cool stuff, um, we have been, we had a lot of, um, um, yeah, a, a lot of suggestions of having local meetups in other languages, not only English. So we uh, created a framework to build local meetups in other regions. Uh, these are more for uh, uh, regions that maybe their, their English is not their native language and they have, they know OSPOs in their regions and they want to hang out, they want to meet informal gatherings. Uh, so um, um, someone from the community suggested to create a Western Switzerland uh, for French speaking audience. And uh, we are proud to announce that finally it's published. The steering committee approved and everything is in place. People, if there is someone from the region there, here, uh, they can go and RSVP uh, to, the, to the local community. And also if you are thinking, oh, that will be perfect in my region, I want that. Uh, there is the framework uh, where people can find more information in case they will be interested to build a new local meetup in other languages. Um, the next thing is that uh, Open Source Summit Japan is around the corner. That is gonna be on December. And with uh, to do an open chain as community supporters, the call for papers are already closed, but um, whether you submitted a talk or not, I think it's a great occasion. And Shane Karemi, uh, Shane Karemi, if I'm wrong, but I think on October 11th, uh, Japan is gonna open the doors to uh, like the, the prior the COVID um, situation. If that is right. correct. So um, I think that is a great opportunity. So um, people can just go the same way uh, they did uh, previous to COVID. So that those are good news. And last but not least, um, 
one of the many um, initiatives we have at Sudo Group is called uh, we have a it's called Ospology, and in Ospology, it's a great repo where people learning to uh, get into OSPO, start building an OSPO, can uh, find useful resources such as the OSPO mind map. Uh, and in this OSPO mind map project. Um, that tries to frame all the different roles, behavior, size, and responsibilities that an open source program offices can take. Uh, we have a new addition, a new merge. Uh, so now the OSPO mind map automatically generates the HTML view in uh, um, continuous integration. So that is the pull, the pull request. And in case you want to know more about the OSPO mind map project, I've also shared with you uh, the link, and um, this is how it looks in case this is the first time you you know about the OSPO mind map. So it's the good thing is that it's interactive and um, we would love to find more contributions for other communities, like for instance, um, about open source compliance and pressure and the open chain community. There is a lot of people that can add more value and maybe uh, propose a new structure that makes more sense. And um, yeah, I think I think that's that's all for the OSPO news for my side. And thank you, Sing. Thank you, Anna. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, and as everyone can tell, obviously to do group and open chain are working quite closely on a few things. The event in Sweden is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we do expect to begin to get European stakeholders sharing a lot of information. Uh, there was a question in the chat where Mary asked if uh, the event will be recorded. The event in Sweden, the Ospology live session, will not be recorded. It's under Chatham House, so people can express things freely and not be afraid that someone will say, oh, Ericsson said this or Volvo said that. So you, you can expect that main events like, say, the regular open chain community calls are always recorded and shared but some of these face-to-face -face events will be held under Chatham House. And, and that of course is one of the reasons there's value in attending events like that. Um, and also value in attending things like the Open Chain Work Group events that happen in let's say Germany or the UK for similar reasons. Now, we have a lot of stuff to do. So I'm gonna dive straight into the next part, which is to touch on some automation. Uh, we, we do have some automation news in that I wanted to flag that the open source review toolkit has had some interesting developments in recent times. Just put the link in the chat. Uh, the open source review toolkit originated in Europe. It has a lot of contribution from, for example, people in companies like Bosch. One of the main people behind it is Thomas Steinberg, who is a very active contributor in the European community and indeed one of the key people behind uh, recent activities uh, around things like to do group Europe for OSPOs. Anyway, the open source review toolkit is a framework which allows people to do an awful lot of automation around open source management. And people have basically traditionally used it for license compliance, but that's not the only thing it can do. And naturally, this is also working towards things like security. The open source review toolkit is very actively developed. I'm just going to show you where is it? You can see here on the commits that commits are coming in, you know, integrations four days ago and so on and so forth. The toolkit being actively developed and covering multiple compliance domains, license and security and so on, uh, will also touch in new areas such as export control where we're seeing emerging threats and challenges. So you should probably keep your eye on this particular thing. The open source review toolkit is open source tooling for open source compliance. There are no restrictions to downloading and using it. And of course, Open Chain has got our reference tooling work group where people like Thomas and all the other creators and maintainers of ORT are freely available to talk with you. Now, I wanna move into our community feedback and comments section. So we're ending the news bits there and moving on to our next bit. Um, I, I wanna show you something before we hand over basically to looking at the education side of things for reference material. 
I want to show you a tiny bit of, I suppose we could call it the sausage factory for what's happening on something like the pass submission. Okay, so there's a lot of talk about how we build a new ISO standard and then we hand it over to JDF and stuff happens. Well, let's have a look at what type of stuff happens and why that happens. When you have a de facto standard in place, like we have with the security assurance reference guide, you then have to cram it into a pass submission document to go through JTC1. And, and for a large part, something like our security assurance specification will survive that process looking relatively like what it looked like originally, but not exclusively. And there's a couple of points that I think are worth going through in how these documents unfold. So I'm just scrolling down here. You'll see that um, our ISO editor, his name is Rex, has been liberally deleting <laughs> stuff throughout the document. Part of these deletions are because he thinks we're doing something stupid. Um, and, and part of them are because he's also picking up specific ISO formatting. Uh, in particular, to be honest, most of it is about making sure that his decades of experience in ISO editing are applied to the wording and approach we use. Uh, he picks up details. For example, you know, he picked up, this is a minor detail, I'm just highlighting it because it's so simple, that we had uppercase um, on open source, we capitalized it as a term, and we also used it as lowercase as open source, and he's saying that should be consistent. That type of editorial is very commonly raised, um, and if he doesn't catch it, it'll actually come back to us in the comments during the ISO validation process itself. So naturally, we want him to get that done so we have as little noise as possible. Some of his comments are more substantial. Uh, for example, Moving down here, he changes all of our headings um, because that's part of the ISO formatting. Apparently all of the ISO formatted headings need to be using sentence case. Uh, that's fine. And so on and so forth. And these type of things go through the document. Um, so sometimes he asks for a complete rewrite of something. For example, on the component record, he wanted a complete rewrite of that. Uh, and he also threw out one of the words we used, uh, we couldn't use the word should in the context of a sentence we had because should means something specific in the um, ISO domain. And that's what happens therefore when we hand Rex a document which we're working on. For those of you who wonder idly what the document actually looks like in our hands, uh, the document is in markdown and it looks you know, similar enough, it looks like this. And then Rex gets hold of it. He gets hold of 1.1, which is what we just released today, um, and then does that to it. <laughs> now, obviously this means that what ISO gets is not exactly the same as our 1.1 spec. And your question might be, given that, what happens with the 1.1 spec? Um, what happens is we merge. Rex is going to finish all of his ISO edits. We're going to get back his newly formatted version, and then we're going to turn it to Markdown and put it into our repository too. And from the future, we'll work off the ISO formatted version of our spec. So future iterations will have less of a lift as we go. <laughs> Seth notes that the ISO editorial guide is over 200 pages long and changes frequently. Um, yeah, and uh, Seth's point there that if people make comments where we breach the guidelines for one reason or another, uh, that could actually delay our submission process and our graduation. So it's important that we get this done. And Rex is an absolute marvel. He's been fantastic. So putting back context there, uh, we will be taking Rex's stuff we'll be merging it back with our specific security reference spec, not just the ISO version. And that means that our entry in our GitHub will be very close to perfectly ISO formatted for future iterations. That will make all our lives easier. It will make updates to the ISO standard quicker. Um, and it will also mean that when people download the open chain version of the spec from our website, they're getting what really feels like an identical uh, version to what's on the ISO site. Last note on this, 
and this is where we leave the sausage factory, is a very simple one. It doesn't matter what version of our security assurance reference spec you get, version 1.0, version 1.1, which is the current, or version 1.2, which will be when we get Rex's edits back. All of them are functionally identical. Okay, so all of them, first generation, are functionally identical. If you adopt one, you'll meet the ISO standard requirements when that is published mid-2023. All of this formatting and so on is, is really about massaging the document into making it as useful as possible to get through the ISO process as quickly as possible, and then in the future as maintainable as possible. And that's the sausage factory of how our security assurance reference spec has gone to market and is being dealt with in the ISO context. If you have any questions, let me know. Okay, if we have no questions on that, we're gonna dive into the next section of our call, which is where we, well, we return into the, the dark lands of editing stuff. Oh, Lufuno has a question. Hey, Lufuno. Fire away, go ahead. I see you unmuted, but for some reason I don't hear your voice. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, no problem at all. Yeah, okay, I just wanted to check because I, I did see that it's like we have different versions, so just to verify that you're saying each version that I might find myself using, it's not different from what Correct. would be the final. Okay, so, okay, thank you. Correct. No, it's a really good question. And I think the best way to look at it is that each generation of the spec is the same. So, you know, spec version 1.x is all the same. It's just minor editorials. And then spec version two point something will be different. So in, in our case, we're dealing with generation one of the security spec, and there's some rapid tweaks to catch small errors or to move into ISO formatting, but the actual requirements are all the same. Um, and that's really why one of the key messages that should be taken away is that the security spec is ready for adoption today. And if you adopt it today, you will be uh, conformant with the ISO standard the moment it is published. Shane, if you don't mind, uh, I've got just a quick comment that might come up in the people's minds. Uh, I, I put it into the, into the chat, but um, one of the important features of the PATH process uh, <clears throat> is that OpenChain still owns the specification. Right? Uh, a lot of people ask this question, you know, well, if we give it to ISO, does ISO own it and can they now begin to control it? And the answer is no. Uh, we will always own the specification. We'll always kind of own the original copyright. Um, it's not that ISO could suddenly pick it up um, as it is and, and then start editing that spec. I believe it is probably possible um, and this is sort of a corner case, so I'm actually not sure. I suppose in theory, it's possible that they could take what we've done and if the copyrights allowed it, you know, fork a new version of it somehow, but I've never heard of that happening. But, but the point is we own it. Um, changes to it come back to us. Uh, and that's just a feature of the past process. So the thing it does for us is it gives us international recognition. It has the... What's the word I want to use? Um, uh, gravitas of an ISO spec. It is an ISO spec. Um, and, and that can be really important for adopters uh, uh, in other countries because that's kind of where they will look for it. So um, I just want to assure you that OpenChain is the owner. Um, we submit it through JDF International, um, but, but, you know, we're... We're just the we're just the the transferring body. You're still the owners. So uh, just for that clarification, that's a, a really good clarification, Seth. And you know, I I think that speaks to the value that we find because OpenChain has a huge multi tentacle global community, 
Um, and a lot of stakeholders have contributed knowledge. So it's very useful to know that our knowledge is codified across this project. And therefore this is the point of entry to deal with these, these standards. Uh, and yeah. yeah. It, we, we often see some countries just won't adopt something that is from a regional SDO. Uh, you know, they, they want it to be there. Um, uh, so yeah, I think that that's why we do it. Yeah, no, it's 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 wonderful, and for everyone who has never dipped into this sausage factory before, uh, we've we've just had a, a great series of luck, I think, in working with Joint Development Foundation and having support from people like David Rudin over at Microsoft uh, at unpacking this process. And Open Chain was the first ISO standard. Uh, from the Linux Foundation in 14 years, and it's first through this past process. So we blazed a trail. Um, and now <laughs> it's interesting to hear that we're only number three with this new spec as well. Uh, the middle spec is SPDX. So which, compliance... Sorry, which also ahead. speaks to the fact, which also speaks to the strength of sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, supply chain uh, integrity uh, being really the place that JDF and LF shines within the open uh, within the ISO um, community. Absolutely, um, and we we have found you know the response from ISO and the working groups to be very positive too. So, for instance, what we got back from working uh, the working group subcommittee twenty seven on security was you know positive towards our spec. They had plenty of ideas and comments and quite a few of the scope stuff is what we'll be talking about for the generation two down the line. All righty, jumping into the next meat of the call, we're running uh, towards the end of the, the call. So what I wanted to do here was really set some context um, so that we would be able to continue the discussion and things like our education work group and so on. Uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about was our path to conformance, and then I wanted to talk about our FAQ. On the path to conformance, this is a pretty nifty thing we had available on our website for quite a long time, where there's different levels in your conformance path, and for each level there's some information about what you might be asking at that level and what type of resources the project has to assist you. I'm going to put the link to the path to conformance into this window right now. Long story short, I think that the path to conformance page um, had a really strong place in the stuff we're doing, but we have had some feedback that people would like to actually see the path to conformance maybe on the first page, but with less links in it. And I wanted to just mental model that very quickly on this call. And I'm gonna do that by activating something and deactivating something on the editing page. This is, this is a, like a cooking show. This is a, and here's one I prepared earlier moment. <laughs> um, so what I'm doing now for those who are not familiar with WordPress is I'm just activating and deactivating a few items of the page to cause it to display differently in one moment. So I wanted to suggest that we potentially do something like this, change it from a bunch of links into a smaller process of um, levels and the levels open up as well, but lead to singular key material. Now, the reason I'm suggesting this is because we actually had new material come in since we originally did the path to conformance, okay? So our compliance um, training material covers all the basics of what is open source compliance, et cetera, et cetera. We did have this in place before, but we didn't have it this refined. When it comes to understanding how Open Chain helps in answering this type of question, we have an education leaflet designed for suppliers that covers all of that. And then of course, when it, become, when it comes to Open Chain conformance, we have, and I'm clicking on the link here, specific resources all across our websites from answering questions about it through to self-certification through to finding partners for third-party certification. So my suggestion was to go from, and again, I'm just gonna show the original very, very quickly.
go from the original into a much more streamlined version that I just showed you. The original being like this, larger collections of links. Now that's just a suggestion. And as I demoed this, I really hacked back on all the stuff that was in the original down to absolute minimum. So it was just a demo, but I just wanna turn over to Nathan here and get his thoughts on that type of approach. Yeah, thank you, Shane. I like the, the streamlined approach. And what I wondered what, um, one of the intentions though was to see if we could bring forward some of the content that's you know, somewhat buried in the website. Um, you know, there's a lot of resources we have, things like that. Um, so what if I suggested this? Um, I, you know, I think for step one, the, the content you pointed to is would be perfect. Um, maybe for some of the other steps, uh, you know, maybe we would point toward another page that would, um, you know, provide some of the other content that we have. You know, I know, I know there's other guides and things like that that people put forward. Um, you know, there's level three, things like the policy is going to be useful. Um, you know, so I wonder if like sending it to people to like a landing page that would help them, you know, find some of the resources they need for this level uh, might, might be helpful. Um, and then that's, lastly, I wonder if, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was saying that's a really good point. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and lastly, I think what if we have level four is like becoming part of the community and then we'll, that way we can bring forward, you know, a lot of the work groups. That, that would be, uh, I think, a very useful thing. So we keep level four, then we take it as an, an onboarding opportunity to link people into our calls, our mailing lists, and so on. Yeah, yeah. I, I like it. So how would you like to proceed on this? Do you think we should do an education call and live edit it, or should we edit offline? What would be your preference of taking that forward? Uh, how about perhaps both? I, I can work on some suggestions, and then we could have a call too. You go through some things. Sometimes it helps to have some some things ready to, to look at. Absolutely, absolutely. All righty, let's do that. Nathan, I'm very excited to work together with you on this. This will be something that um, I think will immediately help you. And we, we have such good material now that I think we can really amp up the usefulness of this path to conformance. So thank you. And if anyone else has suggestions, please let us know as well. The second item I wanted to swing to was our FAQ. And uh, our FAQ is big. <laughs> because it's big, I think we're going to have to spend some time editing this. So mostly I wanted to flag that we need to put time into this. Uh, and the challenge with the FAQ is that the FAQ is originally designed for when we had one spec. So, you know, who conforms to the standard uh, and this type of thing. Now, the thing is that open chain project covers a lot more than one spec now. So the FAQ needs to begin to address that uh, wholeheartedly. And when it goes down to areas like the FAQ talking about specifications, it needs to become plural and to explain uh, what's the same and what's different. So basically, I think we need to revamp the whole FAQ. Uh, and, and therefore, I'm planning to tag the FAQ today with a note that it's under editing. Um, and just as an example, I wanted to show you how some suggestions of um, changes could be. So under the general FAQ, Again, here's one I prepared earlier. I'm going to switch off um, the current general FAQ and switch on a demo FAQ I put up earlier. This is not a huge change, it's just a minor change, but I wanted to give you an idea of the type of alteration I was looking at. So uh, now, the general FAQ explicitly mentions we have two specs. Uh, and, and when it comes to talking about open chain, it, it uses plural. 
about the standards. Um, so this is really about trying to make sure that the FAQ just deals with the fact we've got two specs or more. And I say or more because we've got other material that's very important too. Like in this FAQ, we don't put huge emphasis on our training slides or our policy template, but these are key documents around the world for open source uh, process management. So I'd like to see us leaning heavier into that. Other areas where we currently are not doing our best job is we reference something directly related to our compliance spec, which is the CII best practices badge, or now just recently rebranded OpenSSF best practices. Uh, but we don't also explain the interrelationship between the various process standard and process method projects across the Linux Foundation, like to-do group, SPDX, and so on. So Nathan, my take is we have a big editing job ahead. Um, I just wanted to see what your take was on you know, how, how we should go ahead with that. I, I, as I recall, I think the FAQ is pretty driven by the specification, you know, the first time around. Um, that's that's but, correct. What's yeah, driven by the spec it, previously. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think, I think, you know, there's some good points here. You know, maybe, do you think going forward, maybe we should take a list of, you know, I don't know, maybe we could take a list of common questions or, or ask for questions we could, we could address or, um, you know, I know in our path to conformance, we did throw out some common questions that people had there. Um, and it might be good for somewhere to direct, directly address those as well. Um, That's a really good point. And and yeah. Nathan, given the size of this, and it's got this funky kind of weird menu structure, how about we just throw it out of the funky menu structure and put it into Markdown so we can edit it quickly? <laughs> I like just have that. a simple web page. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I, I think the, uh, yeah, the, the specification questions, you know, were relevant because that's what we were developing at the time, but there's so many more questions now about it the community and what to do and how to get started and things like that. I'll, I'll take an action item to take all of the content from this FAQ, put it into Markdown and get it prepped for us to begin editing on it. And then I'll send it to education and main mailing list to get people's feedback and they can open issues. And we can just begin working on it. Uh, and perhaps on the website, we'll start guiding people towards the GitHub FAQ until the new one is presentable on, on uh, website itself. Would that be doable, do you think? Would that be okay? Yeah, it sounds great to me. All right, Nathan, thank you so much. I just saw Lafuno had her hand up. Lafuno, um, if you've got a question, very happy to take it. Um, thank you. I just wanted to check with you. Uh, during the education work group, I believe it was in that group, uh, we did say that the, the website itself, which will include the FAQs, needs a revamp in terms of how information is presented and stuff. So I just want to check if this, this is the same process of getting us there or is it a different something? Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, I think, the same process. And um, it's really a situation where I think our FAQ uh, needs a full revamp now that we have two specs. But my understanding is that our intent is always to have an FAQ available on our website. Our current one probably needs heavy editing. So we'll redirect to GitHub uh, starting later this week, actually starting tomorrow. And we'll edit on GitHub until we're happy, but then we'll put that in a nicely formatted version uh, back on the website as soon as possible. During this process, uh, you know, please send in questions about what you want to see there. Yari asked if we have any repeating questions from around the world. Um, and yes, I'll make a collection of anything that I uh, can identify as repeating questions so that we cover it uh, as we go. Everyone, we just hit the top of the hour. We're out of time. What can I say? Thank you so much for coming to this uh, first in the new monthly meeting series. As you can see, this is not a presentation. This is a workshop. This is where we actually do work. 
Uh, and that's why it's so valuable to have it so interactive. I'm looking forward to next time. Thank you to Nathan for being a powerhouse and helping us see the future of where we're going with onboarding. Thank you to everyone who carried the security spec across the line, including especially Seth, who in the background does a lot of heavy lifting and never gets any credit. <laughs> uh, thank you to all of you for making this community work. Have a lovely day.